I'm going to be talking about server-side rendering at Drupal site with Next.js. I hope most of you are familiar with Next.js. Um, if you're not, this is not the let me tell you about Next.js session. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe look at the you know schedule, find something that will fit what you want to understand. Um, my name is uh, John Alvin Wilkins. Um, I'm I've been a web developer since 1993. At Drupal Dev since 2004, I just had my 20th Drupal anniversary. Um, I've been in Core Dev since 2006. I'm in inside the maintainers.txt file that is on your laptop right now. <laughs> um, I probably will be there forever because I am the maintainer of the Stark theme, which is two YAML files and a PNG. Um, and I've also done like 70 different presentations uh, and keynotes in different continents. Um, I'm also one of the maintainers of a Next Drupal project. Uh, this is a little library that makes it easier to connect Next.js to Drupal JSON API or GraphQL endpoints. Um, so. I should point out that I wrote all these slides this morning. <laughs> um, I, I submitted this talk at the end of June because I knew, or sorry, the end of yeah, the end of July because I knew I was going to be here visiting family. Um, but my my visit has been completely upside down. There was a death in the family, so we're still going to have fun. I know all the material. Just have never practiced these slides, <laughs> but because of that, let's do this a little bit more dynamic. If you have questions in the middle of any slide, please raise your hand, and we'll address them immediately instead of at the end of the at the end of the session. Because maybe I'm just forgetting to talk about something. Okay, so that that's the opportunity there that you're going to have is you're going to be able to influence my talk while it's happening. So, server side rendering. Um, if Drupal can already do server-side rendering, um, why are we having this completely separate Next.js JavaScript application do server-side rendering? Why JavaScript rendered on the server versus PHP rendered on the server? To which I say, you know, <laughs> there's this older technology called HTML on the server. <laughs> Which is even faster. It could render your page in zero milliseconds. <laughs> um, everything old is new again, right? Um, the earliest blog platforms uh, were just Perl scripts that would render your content into static HTML files, right? So now we have JavaScript rendering static HTML files. That's just the way it's going to be. Um, React version 19 introduced this thing called server components and client components. It is a pre-release. Um, that means that if you download React right now, it's version 18. That's the official release. Um, but React was like, how do we get, how do we, it, normally React is rendered on the client, right? It's just a bunch of JavaScript in the browser rendering all of your HTML inside your web browser. And React was like, how do we get this rendered onto a file on your server? And the problem is, is that there's all these different bundlers. There's Webpack, uh, there's Snowpack, there's a bunch of different bundlers, and they all do things slightly differently. And React would need to know how to do every single one of them works in order to get it to render to a file. And they decided they were going to write an API and then just let the bundlers and the frameworks figure out how to use the API. So that's what they've done. And that means that Next.js, one of the frameworks for React that makes building React apps easier, in my opinion, I prefer Next.js and have since before this all came about. Next.js, in its official version 14 release, will use the unofficial pre-release version of React 19 in the background in order to implement React server components inside your Next.js app, okay? That's, that's what's going on when you install Next.js 
version 14. And it's, it's really easy to get started with it because you just, you know, you use the create next app that comes with Next.js. Right? So you can run npx uh, create next app at latest and it will just prompt you, you know, do you want to use TypeScript, ESLint, Tailwind, and then it'll ask you, do you want to use the app router? Of course you do. And you just say yes. Right? Um, how many people already have next day apps are running though. Anybody? One person. Okay. The good news is that if you have a what would I consider a legacy system now using the old version of Next.js that uses what's called the pages router, it's really easy to migrate from the old pages router to Next.js's new app router because they designed it to be done per route or per page rather than having to convert the whole thing. It's not a Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 migration. You can do every single, every single page, every single path can be done independently. So, you know, 95% of your site can be done in pages router, just, just the new stuff is done in app router. And you just migrate over each path one at a time, and it makes it really much easier to migrate to an app router. What does the app router look like? Not surprisingly, um, it's just a bunch of folders. <laughs> um, if you want to have a, so here we have the source directory at the top here, and then all of our uh, all of our app routes go inside the app directory, and we define a route by creating a subdirectory inside our app directory. So admin here is a path, a route, in our Next.js app. And we just create a little page.js file that says, this is the React component that we want to render as that page. And then you can see we have a settings folder, um, and then there's a page.js inside there. So if the user requested slash admin slash settings, Next.js is going to go and grab that page.js and render that. Very straightforward. There is also a thing called a dynamic path. Um, you, can, you can see here we have underneath blog. Blog is a, a static route. We've defined that as a path. So if you go to slash blog, uh, the Next.js app is going to render blog page.js file. But if you go to blog Twin Cities 2024 is awesome, you know, it's gonna, it won't find a directory that matches that path, but if it sees that there is this special directory that has square brackets, the square brackets is what tells Next.js that this is a dynamic route. And I have used the word segment here, but you don't have to use the segment. In fact, if you look at the documentation, you're going to see that it uses the word slug all over the place. But that, that's just a convention that the Next.js docs have. Um, you get to decide what that word is in your directory, but it's just looking for the square brackets. Square brackets say that this is a dynamic route inside blog, so it will handle any pages, any paths that don't match a static route in that folder. Um, and then, of course, you have to have a page.js file inside that directory. We will go over the specific, specifics of how that works in a second here. Um, but I, I've only shown you the page.js, but actually, uh, the next app router has a bunch of different special files that you can use inside each of your route directories. There's a layout file, layout.js, template.js, error.js, loading, not found, and page.js. And it will create this structure for you if it finds these files in a directory. So if you have a layout.js, this can be like, I'm going to put my header and my footer inside this layout file. It will wrap the rest of your files in your layout.js component. And it will grab that component from the layout.js file. 
the layout.js um, gets inherited by subdirectories. So you can have a layout.js in the root of your app directory, and it will use that layout for every single route in your entire app. It's pretty convenient. You can have different layouts for different parts of your site too by just putting them in different directories. Question over there. Is there a way to prevent some directories from inheriting? Is there a way to prevent subdirectories from inheriting the layout.js? Um, I mean, kind of. You could put a layout.js in a subdirectory that just didn't have anything significant in it. You know, it would just be like an empty component. That would override the layout. Oh, sorry, no wait. I'm sorry. <laughs> I layouts are special. Um, when you have layouts in a subfolder, a subdirectory, it actually gets nested inside the outer layer layout.js. So the layout.js of the whole app becomes the wrapping layout, and then the subdirectory will have its own layout you know, in, that's interior to the extra, the main layout.js. But you can still do some funky things. Um, I think this is going to be a question for, I'll talk to you afterwards, maybe. <laughs> um, there's, there's a feature to do this. It's really hard to explain. <laughs> I could point at some code, some doc pages about it. OK. And then we also have air.js. How many people, people here have ever had errors appear in their React apps? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Next.js makes it really easy to handle those errors rather than your entire like app just showing that horrible like overlay that's saying that it's broken. Right? Um, you can create an air.js file and it'll render that component instead. Um, and you can see here how it's nested inside the structure. Um, and then you have the loading.js. Yeah? Does Next have at least a production mode where it doesn't show that, it just logs the error? Uh, so the question was, uh, does Next.js have a production mode that doesn't show that the error overlay? Yes, it does. I mean, like, okay. that, that's how the dev version of you know displays errors, and like that's how we typically see it when we're doing development work. Um, it's not going to do that during production. Um, I forget what it looks like in production, but it's not good either. <laughs> so having a friendly error message, that's what this is for, right? You want a friendly error message to your user, um, and then probably you can add some code in there to log, to log it, you know, in a production logging facility. Um, and then we have uh, loading.js. Now, if we're, I think I might have to come, no, loading.js. So if we're rendering on the server, we're not loading anything. We're just loading the HTML into the browser. Um, the loading.js is for, yeah, is if our page, requires some client-side JavaScript. You know what, I'm gonna have to come back to this one. Sorry. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'll come back to the loading.js. Not found.js, this is if you're inside a dynamic route, um, and it turns out that your application doesn't know that route, it'll show the not found content instead, right? So if you've gone to blog slash Twin Cities 2023. <laughs> um, if your app doesn't, if your you know your application, your backend Drupal CMS probably right doesn't know about that path, it'll show the not found JS. And of course, we've already talked about page.js. We've now come to the slides that I have not finished. <laughs> um, I do have an outline here, um, and I do have some code to show. So let's switch over to mirroring. There we go. And then we're looking at this. Um, and I gotta switch over here to dynamic routes. We're talking about dynamic routes. <laughs> okay.
So a, a static route is really easy for Next.js to render. It, it looks for the page.js and goes, oh, here's, I know the path already because it's inside this static route that I'm defined by directories. Um, I'm just going to render this component and save it to an HTML file. But when you have a dynamic route, like we here have under blog, right? It doesn't know where to save the HTML. So it has to know what the paths are before it can save it to HTML. And the way that it does that is with a function that you export inside your, so this is inside your page.js file. You, I'm gonna turn off messages. <laughs> you, um, inside your page.js file, you export a function called generate static params. And it needs to be an async function, an async function, because of course it, it needs to like probably go out and grab some data from a server right, in order to figure out what the paths are. And that's gonna be do, done asynchronously. You can use uh, fetch, right? just ordinary browser, JavaScript fetch function in order to grab data. Um, in this example, I'm using the next Drupal package, um, and it has a, a helpful uh, method on the objects that it creates that all it's doing in the background here is, is it's calling fetch to the JSON API endpoint of your Drupal server. Go ahead. Is that a library? Like, is that a generic library for? Or did you write that? Uh, Next Drupal is a, um, it's, the project's been around for a while. Um, and uh, yeah, you can download it on npm.js. You just like npm install next dash Drupal. Okay. Um, I've only been a maintainer for a few months of it, but it's existed for a while. Um, and so this get resources collection path segments, <laughs> it's a mouthful. But it's trying to get path segments, right? It's trying to figure out what are the dynamic path segments that you need based on a resource collection, which is a JSON API terminology, but it basically says, tell me your node types, and I will give you all the paths for those node types. So this function, uh, Drupal get resource collection path, Segments, if we tell it, like, give us all the page nodes and all the article nodes, it'll return an array of all of the paths for those two content types. Um, all of these code comments are actually inside the next Drupal um, package. You can Look at the code on GitHub, and in it there are some starter kits you can use. Um, and I believe those code comments from come from the starter kits. Let me double check. Yeah, yeah. So this file is comes from the starter kit. So inside next Drupal starters basic starter app slug page .tsx. There it is. Um, and this one. This is happening server side. Yes. Okay. This this is happening server side. So when um, when we do a production build, um, which is going to be oh, let's open up. So I I may I ran uh, create next app this morning, and so I created this package that day as, JSON file, um, and yeah. So in order to do production and build, I just run npm run build, and it'll run the next build command, and that'll make a production build. So it'll render all of the HTML that you need for a server rendered <laughs> set of files for your app. Right? Okay. That's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
just happening client side for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is all running server side right now. So, um, oops, I have opened a particular file. This is the one thing I don't like about um, it's hidden the tabs of. PHP Storm has hidden the tabs of the files I have, and I can't see different files. Wait, can I look right click here? Show tabs, thank you. Oh, this not, wait, that's not what I wanted. Okay, right, I'm just gonna have to turn off, sorry about this, turn off presentation mode. Go back to this one. Ah, there we go. Um, you can just zoom in like this. That'll work too. Okay. I was showing you this page. Okay. So generate static params. Um, so once we have that um, that array of all of our paths. Um, we're just going to go through that array and return it in a format that um, Next.js is expecting. And it's expecting that for every path, it's looking for a, an object that has the specific dynamic route name that we specified in the directory. And then that key We'll point at the entire path for um, for this segment. Um, slug here. I said the docs use slug. I forgot that this file uses slug, but I actually need to change this to match my directory. So I'm going to type segment there so that this matches the fact that I called that directory bracket segments. If I change this to slug, then that means that Next.js will be expecting this name right here to match that folder name. That's, that's what that's for, okay? So it's looking for an array of objects with just this key saying, this is the, this is the path, this is the dynamic path that I'm trying to determine, and then this is what the dynamic path part is. About dynamic routes? Yeah. Okay. Just to zoom out a little bit, this is, for example, if you wanted to host a single blog, and like I'm pretty, I think I remember uh, Drupal can host multiple blogs on the same site. They would have different. They would be both of content type article, but they would have different. Um, well, there's a way to do this, right? In a view. But this is something different because I'm just separating the functionality of the array of, say, slugs or segments that are however you designated what you're getting back from Drupal. Mm -hmm. But I'm having trouble separating what Next.js is doing versus what Drupal could do. Right. With can its functions. can you describe the setup of your, your site? You, multiple sites well, set up how? Because there are like five different ways you can do it in Drupal. So which, which was the one you're talking about? Well, you've gotten, you've asked You've had Next.js ask Drupal for a mm -hmm. collection of nodes mm -hmm. of a certain type. Right. And even I see the functionality of getting multiple types here too, but I'm not sure what where Drupal ends and Next.js begins and where Next.js begins and React begins here. Okay. Um, so when you have a, a multi-site setup. Each of those sites will either have their own JSON API endpoint or not, because you can like enable that or disable that. Right. So each, when we're connecting to, uh, using these functions to call Drupal, we're calling a specific endpoint. Okay. Right? Yeah. So we can have different, different Next.js apps point at different Drupal endpoints. That's all fine. But, <coughs> This is one specific Next.js 
talking to one specific JSON API endpoint. Now I can't. Okay. And you've like gone in and configured a, a view or something yes. like that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Config yes. Configuring um, which endpoint you point at is something you do inside um, inside one of these files. <laughs> Not that one. This one. And helpfully, it is a process variable, or a environment variable. <laughs> um, but you just specify a, a, a base URL that you, then you pass to the next JS, or the next Drupal uh, code. Um, and then you can like specify you know, your, your client ID, your client secret. So that all that's configured. Um, and you grab it from um, environment variables so that you're not like hard coding those values into your Git. Right. Um, question over there. Can you nest static paths within a dynamic path? So, for example, if you have products and a product name and then like a specification page or something like that within that product, within each product, can you do that? I believe that you can, yes. So, the question was can you nest static routes inside dynamic routes? Um, yeah, you can. Um, so if we did that for, yeah, so let's just pretend instead of block there it says products, um, we could create a new directory called specs. Um, and then we just need to create a file in there called page.js. And because We would, so what would happen is that we, inside this first file, remember we need to call Drupal and say, give me all the paths. We would need to do, I think we would need to do that again inside here, maybe? I know, I know that you can't do it. I can't remember the specifics. <laughs> I'll have to think about that. I know you can, but I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember the specifics. Really curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's all again. No worries. Absolutely. Yeah, that is the point. Uh, you could also do the pagination from the view, but then there's no point to paginating when you're asking for the exhaustive list. Right? Um, paginations as um, page, yeah. as path URL. So if you wanted to have it part of the, I mean, if it's, if it's search params, then it's not actually part of the route, right? Yeah. But if it's if you wanted to hard code those as routes, then you would need to figure out how many pages ahead of time, which you can I do, realize. but like it would, you there's would no need to query to, for it. I'm and, also realizing there's no point in paginating when you're literally asking for all of it, so you can hard code for you, so you can render them all on server side, the exhaustive list of all the nodes mm -hmm. at the moment. So. I think I've got dynamic routes done. Generate, generate, standard routes. Right. So now, oh, now that it knows what the path is, the other thing in page.js that you need to do is have a default export that is a React component. Right. And in this example, I'm using a node page uh, React components. And inside there, you specify params, and then you got to tell it what the path is. Right. So this, again, this slug is a convention. Just make sure it matches your actual directory name, dynamic part. Yeah. Um, and then we now have the path inside this component. And wait. Right there. Sorry. Um, again, we're gonna, we don't have the data, we just have the path. This is an async function because we want to use fetch again to get the actual data from Drupal. Um, and you can do this any way you want. I've created this little node, get node function. It's literally just here at the top of the page. So you can do anything you want as long as it's getting data somehow. It could be reading it from a file, whatever. Like, um, I 
I created this function that is an ASIC function, and again, it's using next Drupal in this case. Given the slug, it will down here get the actual resource, the actual content. Um, and then once it has that, it just returns it. So now it's got all the data down here in the component inside our node variable. And then you just render a React.js component as usual, but now with data. It's, it's pretty basic. So let's, do, let's go over the whole thing again. So we have this page.js. We don't know the path yet. So we look at generate static params. And we need to figure out what are all the possible paths for this dynamic route. We call Drupal, say, give me all the paths for this node. Great. Then for every single path that we've returned, next to and we'll go, oh, well, now I need to render that actual path on the server. And then it will use the default export, which is a component, which then calls Drupal again to get the actual content for that page, and then it saves it all to an HTML file. And basic premises on server, we just did that too. Now, the thing is, is that how many people here have ever used um, like use effect? in React, right? Those of you who use React, you've used use effect. That is a client-side hook. You cannot run this on the server. I have, like, almost all of my components have US effect or use effect hook in it because, like, if I want to open up my navigation bar, I have to click on the navigation bar. That means I need to have some client-side JavaScript running to check for the click and then showing and like changing class names and all this stuff. All of that is done on the client side. If we try to include a use effect hook in a component that is rendered on the server, React is going to just barf and say, nope, you can't do that. You, you will get a hard error. It will stop your entire production build. But like I said, it's in almost all of my components. But there is a way to separate these out. This is why React has designed server components and uh, client components as a separate thing. And the way you specify the way you specify that something is a server component is nothing. You just don't use client-side code in it, and it will just assume it's a server component. If you put some client-side component in the server component, you'll get an error. If you want to say, I'm going to use some client-side code in this component, you have to add use client in quotes here at the top of your file. And that defines that this component is a client-side component. And when we, um, when we use that, let me go, where's this? Right to traffic here. <clears throat> When we try to use that component, if we try to use a, a, client, a component that's defined as a client component, when we, we just normally like use that inside a server component, React will be able to say, oh, that's a client component. I'm not going to render that part. I will render everything else, and I will just like put a little placeholder in the HTML that says, to be added later, right? <laughs> um, it, it adds it. There's a whole like technical specification of like how it does it. it. Doesn't really matter the details that much. But basically, the HTML there's going to be a little like there's going to be a little thing in the HTML that says, and it won't be visible. It will not be visible. That says this is where the client component goes. And then once that HTML page goes to the web browser, React is going to run. It's going to go. Oh, I need to like rehydrate my pages. We can be inserting all of this client code back in. It will find that spot and then add and run all of our client code at that time in the right spots. So all you need to do is actually just use a client component inside a server component and it will sort of do this seamlessly. 
the problem is, is that it's invisible, and you probably do want to have the button that opens up your nav bar to be visible before it shows up in the web browser. Which means that you want to create what's called a suspense um, suspense boundary. Um, so we're going to import suspense from React. It is a component that specifies what the fallback is for something. So you can have a a server version of your client component that just renders the, you know, the non-client-ish content version of that client component. That did not make any sense. Let me try again. <laughs> if you've got a button that has JavaScript that runs on the client that handles button clicking, you want to also have a version of that that is just a server component that shows the button with no clicky bits in it. So we will create a suspense boundary and then specify uh, what our alternate should be, what the server-side version of our client component should be. Um, I did not have a very good example here. I'll do better next time I do this presentation. <laughs> um, but you would literally just write So, instead of showing the contents of it should be our clicky button, but the fallback should be the non-clicky button. Okay? That's how we, we create these suspense boundaries between um, what should be shown when we render it on the server and what should be dynamically created on the web browser. Hope that made sense. <laughs> we have officially gone through all of the completely blank slides. <laughs> uh, and now we're on to the live demo. <laughs> How much time do I have? I got five minutes. Actually, this is good. I didn't, I, it's the right amount of time. Um, so, um, there is a website that I have been a little bit a part of uh, building. Um, chapter three uh, just launched this website on Monday, I think. So that's why I get to show it to you. Otherwise, I would not be able to show you this. Uh, this is a public URL, um, <laughs> so anybody can see this. This is the uh, National Association of Realtors. This is what their uh, code of ethics uh, page looks like. Um, this site just launched, it's running Next Drupal, it's running Next.js, it's got all the Drupal bits, it's got all the cool Next.js bits. Um, it is not yet doing server rendering because it started before server and client uh, components were available. But, but I wanted to give you a demo of what the next Drupal, Drupal modules will do to your Drupal site. One of the great things and here is the admin site of a, a copy of the CMS that's running inside the dev on my laptop right now. Right? And you can see here there's view and edit tabs, revisions, all the normal tabs for a page. And because it's rendered in Next.js and not with Drupal, you normally don't get to see anything in the view tab. But with the next Drupal modules, um, and oops. Which are available here. <laughs> Project slash next. You just install those. Um, and then when you go to um, a page, it loads an iframe that you configure to point at your real Next.js website. Right? So you're inside the CMS, you're looking at a, a page. Like that's that's the actual path, like about NAR, governing documents, the code of ethics. That's the same path as on the real site. So in your CMS, you're going to the same path, but now you've loaded an iframe of the Next.js app rendering this page. 
And when we go in and edit, which I'm not going to show you, it's just a regular Drupal edit screen, you can edit things and then come back to this, this view tab and see all your changes immediately. And we can even do uh, revisions. So we can click on any of these and see that specific revision rendered inside Next.js dynamically. It's not rendered on the server in this case. Um, and the way that it does it is through some sort of secret handshake. The, the CMS says, hey, Next.js, can you render this page using this revision ID? And Next.js says, hey, I think you're a hacker. <laughs> uh, you just want me to render a random revision ID of a node? No, I'm not going to do that. But I will go ask my CMS, which I know a specific URL for my CMS, and ask them if it's okay if I render it. And then it goes, hey, Drupal, which I know you, can I render this revision of this node? And then Drupal goes, yes, that really was me. I'm not a hacker. This is me. Yes, render it. And it goes, okay, thanks. Um, can I have the page now? <laughs> and then it'll show you that revision ID of this particular piece of content. It's pretty slick. It's secure. Um, and it's rendered dynamically, not on the server side. Um, but that's just, it's handy. Um, that's one of the things that I like about that project. Okay. Um, and that is the live demo part. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> And now there are just a couple more slides um, that actually have content. So let me switch back to stop hearing. And we got like a minute left. This is fine. So one of the things that we're going to talk about is the perils of a catch-all route. Now, if you want to have your content editors define all the paths, you can do that with, with uh, dynamic routes. Right? You just have a dot, dot, dot slug here. And that basically says, the dot, dot, dot says that not just this one path segment. It might be multiple nested paths. So like this will handle, because it's in the, the root of our app directory, it'll handle blog slash whatever and admin slash whatever. Every single path that is not statically defined, this will handle everything. And it sounds great because that means your editors get full control over the URLs. You don't have to define anything on your Next.js site. Sounds great. There's just one problem. PHP imports are dynamic. If a path, if a particular path on a Drupal site needs paragraphs, it just imports the code based on that path. But any path that doesn't need paragraphs, it won't load that code. But JavaScript imports are static. So if a page, if a page JS route needs paragraphs, it loads all the paragraphs. And because we're using a catch-all route, that means every single path includes every single paragraph component. All of them, every path contains all your components in the entire app. Thanks. All components are imported for all paths. That is not a great way to have <laughs> a small download size. But there's a solution for this. There's two parts to it. Normally they would ask you, like, you saw it with path auto in, in Drupal, right? You don't want your content admins to create any crazy URL. You use path auto so that the information architecture is more sane, right? If you do that, which you should do, then that means that we will have one next JS route per path auto pattern. And that means that there are fewer static things that we need to import in that, that specific Next.js route because you have blog slash and then you just include the, the components that are needed for blogs. And that's a lot less than you need for the rest of the site. So you'll end up with a smaller bundle for your blog route. Um, the other one is you should really constrain paragraph types per field. Right? If you just allow anybody to use whatever paragraph type in any field, you're still going to have this mess of I'm including all paragraph types anytime I need a single paragraph. But if you constrain it per field and limit to say like on a blog you only get to use five paragraph types, like just those five, and then you statically include those five paragraph type components in your route. 
that'll reduce your bundle size. That's how you get around this problem of all the components for all paths. And that's it. And I'm only two minutes over. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for your questions.